with all of us. Um, so let me just say a couple of words and perhaps, uh, well, we want to hear from you, so I will not spend too much time. So uh, students, uh, so I want this discussion to be uh, focused on your uh, questions to the minister. So we have, so yes. Uh, Recording in I progress. Start, uh, I apologize. Uh, so this will be recorded. Uh, so we can, uh, we can, any, I received a lot of uh, uh, emails from students who cannot attend, unfortunately, and so would love to see the recording afterwards. Uh, so we are really honored today to have Minister Tang with us uh, to, oh, be, oh, to be able to answer our questions. Uh, minister Tang is a Minister of Digital of Taiwan. And I believe uh, one of the a really interesting and main actor around the digital transformation happening now and played really an interesting role in Taiwan about that. Um, so my name is Flandre Mack. I am the program director of the Global Connectivity Program, which is a program trying to link technology and culture and humanity. So we are really thrilled to have Minister Tang with us today. That is really a central topic of the program. So uh, as I said, I would keep it short. So Minister, may I ask you to say a couple of words to introduce yourself and just perhaps a little bit of your vision around what you're doing at the ministry and how you see digital transformation? Certainly. Um, I will be very brief because I want to leave more time uh, for the Q&A. So I will simply read uh, my job description, uh, which is a poem, a prayer that I wrote in 2016 before, right before becoming the digital minister. I believe that outlines the main vision. It goes like this. When we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So uh, that's literally my job description. While IT connects machine to machines, I believe digital connects people to people. Now back to you. Thank you very much, Minister. So students, I will ask you to uh, well, put your questions either in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I will just start with one little question perhaps to start the discussion, which is, uh, I know that Minister Tang, you really uh, have close connection with Japan. And I would, I would be curious about what kind of advice could you give Japanese students or students here that are interested in participating and leading the digital transformation of today? Certainly. Um, I always encourage uh, students with the favorite quote from Lena Cohen, and I quote, Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything, and that is how the light gets in. Now, as we're students, anything that we try, entrepreneurship, starting social innovations, and so on, it doesn't need to be perfect. If it's too perfect, well, you may get a A plus grade, uh, but there's very little uh, what others may offer you because you're already so perfect but rather choose something that autonomously link to other people and uh, to what the common good uh, so that you're very ambitious and you can only deliver a very small part of the ambition. You will look very imperfect, but it's that imperfectness that invites people around uh, the world to discover each other, share the common values and interests. Indeed, I think it was called Cunningham's Law that on the internet, the best way to answer a question is not to ask a perfect question, but rather to offer a bad answer so that people can chime in with better answers. That's my suggestion to you. 
Thank you very much, Minister. So I see there's quite a few hands raises. So go ahead, uh, Saiki, why don't you start? Um, Minister Tang, big fan, really big inspiration. Um, I watched uh, quite a few of your interviews and there's this one part in particular I was uh, really uh, interested about. You mentioned that Taiwan is a uh, is neither uh, like ambitions or future for Taiwan is an upwing rather than uh, mm -hmm. falling into a left mm -hmm. wing or right right mm -hmm. wing. Yes, uh, I would like you to elaborate more upon it and uh, what you know. How can Japan also um, achieve some some sort of similar ambitions mm -hmm. if that were the case? Thank you. Uh, really good question. Now I believe I said that in the context of the earthquakes because we're caught between the Eurasian plate and the Philippine Sea plate. And every time there's an earthquake, uh, the tip of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters, grow by a few centimeters. Now, the idea here is that instead of leading toward um, the Eurasian plate or toward the Philippine Sea plate, it's not toward any particular direction, but rather taking all the sides. Whenever tension, whenever conflict occurs, it's natural to engage in a fight or flight uh, response. But instead of fighting or fl uh, going like to flee, um, we can actually look at the tension as an invitation to work co-creation. And the reason why is that we've already built our infrastructures in a uh, earthquake-proof way. Uh, or fireproof way or disaster proof way. Uh, and once we're reasonably sure that we have an underlying infrastructure that are resilient, that's to say, uh, recovers very quickly after an earthquake, then we can welcome uh, such natural disasters <clears throat> as ways to, um, for the social sector to band together, to test uh, people's relationship muscles, uh, to build solidarities, uh, and so on, to view it in a anti-fragile, in a positive light. I mean, Japan, uh, like probably more so than any other country, uh, can relate to this because you also have earthquakes and typhoons. A lot of very important civic technology, including the messenger line and many others, were built uh, in response uh, to the earthquake uh, and many other natural disasters. So I don't think Japan need to uh, steer itself toward this vision. I believe we already share this value and vision. Thank you very much, uh, Saiki. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Miho, you, go ahead. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, I'm very, very excited to be here. <laughs> and thank you for uh, joining us today. So yeah, I've read that you've not only worked on the encouragement of digital use, but also worked very hard on the elimination of like digital divine and the gap that's caused by the encouragement of digital use. And some um, quite a lot of people are concerned about the digital or technology because that would also have the negative aspect. But do you believe that if it is used correctly and um, if you take the correct measure, digital will bring almost all positive aspects in our mm -hmm. life? That's a very philosophical question. Um, I think uh, in Taiwan, digital and plural uh, is the same word, uh, shu wei. Uh, and so in Mandarin, uh, because digital has numbers, right, digits uh, as its root, uh, and uh, numerous, uh, like plural, uh, more than one, um, also is the same word. So when I say I'm the digital minister in Taiwan, I also mean that I'm the plural minister. Now, the idea about plural, which is collaboration across diversity, means that there is no single right way to do something. If there is a very strong will from the political top down uh, that says, oh, this is the only way, every other way doesn't count, then it's not digital. Uh, it is just a singularity, right? Not plurality anymore. Uh, and that leads to maybe uh, some optimized feeling uh, for some of the participants, but for everybody else involved, 
is uh, literally decimating, like taking away 10% every time. Their agency, their way to shape the narrative, to shape their culture. So I do not think that there is a particular right way to make use of technology so that the society collectively can converge on the correct positive outcome. Rather, I believe in the humbleness of design so that people closest to the pain can customize um, the digital technology to fit their purpose. It should be the technology to fit the norm of the society rather than disrupting the society to fit that of the technology. And if you take this view, then you're humble to the future generations so that the younger the people are, the more possibility they have. But if you take an authoritarian view on digitalization, or I call it digitization, there's no all in digitization, uh, then uh, you're leaving all behind uh, and people uh, in the next generation will not enjoy much agency because it's already predetermined uh, by the authoritarian use of technology. So the more possibility there is to future generations, I think the more plural it becomes. And whether it is good or bad, left or right, is left as an exercise for the new generation to customize uh, themselves. Hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miho, for your question. Uh, Nanami, go ahead. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I'm very happy and excited to meet with you. And um, I really appreciate your cooperation. And I heard that you learned programming since you were young, and you learned you learned Perl since you were mm -hmm. twenty years old. And so I, I think you are the genius of self education, and self -ed and also self education is important for us all scholars to be a life lifelong learner. So I would like to hear some tips from you mm -hmm. to do uh, self education and become a lifelong learner. Thank you. Um, I learned of uh, Pearl when I was, I think, 14 uh, years old. That was 1995. Um, and I learned that because um, I was interested in this game called NetHack, uh, which is like a Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, and many other science fiction and fantasy game uh, rolled into a, a PC game. It's one of the earliest uh, rook-like games. Uh, so that I played the game, I uh, learned about the, the lore, uh, and I was interested in uh, using the then very new World Web to search about um, issues uh, related to high fantasy and to wizards and so on. Uh, and that led me to this uh, website uh, called Wizards. Uh, it's a trading card game of Magic the Gathering. Uh, so I started to play Magic the Gathering and learn English. So my first English vocabularies are all Magic cards. Uh, and now uh, as I play more Magic the Gathering, I found that there is this website called Mox Pearl, uh, M-O-X-P-R-L, uh, that offers the uh, card uh, search and many other important databases uh, back then. It's a pun because Mac Mox Pearl is a magic card. Anyway, and so I learned about that website. Uh, and then uh, that website is written uh, by a famous uh, Pearl contributor. And that led me to from Chris Chanson to Larry Wall to the early uh, Pearl people. And so to me, it's always team before tech. I, I didn't learn Pearl because I want to use a technology. I want to learn Pearl because I've already read uh, Tolkien poetry. Uh, I've uh, immersed myself into this high fantasy culture, uh, and I want just want to make friends uh, and uh, have something to uh, work with each other. So I, uh, on the very early days, started a pearl mongers group in Taiwan uh, and said that this is like a sea pen, the gathering, uh, meaning that the Pearl modules that people share with each other is a kind of trading card game uh, that uh, people play together and build interesting things. And mostly it's just about those social relationship muscles that uh, we enjoy being together and the modules that we share and so on that are just like the cards. It's just a excuse uh, for us to make friends uh, around the world. So 
team before tech, I think, is the most important thing when you're learning something by yourself because uh, passion or purpose really um, makes you motivated on your better days. But on your uh, not so good days, uh, it takes a community, a team uh, to remind you that it doesn't need to be all you. You don't have to carry the entire burden, but there's very interesting things going on no matter whether you're feeling productive or not productive. So a engaging team with shared hobbies. I think that is very important. Later on, I would summarize that into a philosophy called optimizing for fun or dash o fun. Uh, and that says we're not optimizing for speed or for performance in our community. We're optimizing for this interpersonal fun. Hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, hello. Um, firstly, thank you very much for coming today. I've been a big fan of yours for three years, and uh, it's an honor to be able to talk with you. Um, by, by the way, I have a question about v Taiwan. Um, you made an online platform, v Taiwan, where everyone can exchange their opinions about low abandonments. Um, amendments. So on this platform, not only you can see your and uh, yours and uh, other people's position on discussion, but also you can see the individual profile of other people's. Um, this is very unique point to be Taiwan, I think. But my concern is that people would be hesitate to speak up their honest opinion, especially when they talk about sensitive topic because your friends or families would know what opinion you have. So some people might believe that the anonymity, uh, anonymity on SNS such as Twitter encourages people to express their honest opinion. Then my question is what, what is the advantage and disadvantage to open the individual information on Bui Taiwan and why did you introduce the open individual um, information system? <laughs> Thank you. Um, the VTAWAN platform uses for first the discourse platform and later on the polis platform uh, at pol.is. Now, uh, after VTAWAN, which was a civil society experiment, um, found that polis is really useful, it's now a both a civic infrastructure at polis.tw uh, and also a public infrastructure at polis.gov.tw so that any public servant can start a wiki survey. Uh, the very simple uh, one-click setup, they don't have to uh, learn anything uh, more than they start a Google survey or um, survey cake or something, right? Uh, so basically, it's commoditifying uh, this crowdsourcing agenda technology now, uh, as in running any surveys, it's important so that people do not game the system uh, by just dominating the discussion by creating 5,000 accounts, right? Uh, and especially later on, uh, the VTAL methodology is used also on the join platform, a national platform where 5,000 petitions uh, or counter signatures uh, will warrant a ministerial uh, response. And again, if one single person can just create 5,000 accounts, then this is not going to be very useful. So we struck a balance uh, between full anonymity, which creates 5,000 clones, uh, and uh, for revealing of personal attributes, which will, as you said, uh, discourage whistleblowing and speaking up, uh, speaking truth to power in a power imbalanced uh, situation. So we've always converged uh, for a few years now on people providing a SMS a number that is registered uh, in one of our local telecoms. Because when you get your SIM card in Taiwan, it requires uh, identification, two photo IDs as a proof. Uh, it's actually very difficult to get 5,000 SIM cards. Uh, if you do, the anti-money laundering uh, service will be after you very quickly. Uh, so we're reasonably sure that each person only have like low single digit number of uh, SIM cards and that, that is fine, right? So uh, the platform uh, makes sure that uh, people are authenticated through SMS. But the uh, photo ID and the information is not transmitted 
to the platform operator. So it's uh, two different uh, agencies. One is the telecom that verifies your identity but doesn't know uh, which proposals you propose because you do so over a pseudonym. Uh, but uh, in the platform, uh, Join or Vital and Platform's case, we know uh, what you propose but it's under a pseudonym and we do not actually know beyond that you have a valid uh, mobile phone number. We do not know your identity. So it's uh, as long as those two parties do not collude uh, the anonymity is still preserved, but people cannot create uh, 5,000 uh, sock puppets. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Yuka. Thank you, Minister. We have a lot of interesting questions. So, Tetsushi, go ahead. Great. Um, thank you, and thank you for coming today. And uh, my question is kind of related to Miho's question. Uh, it was very interesting that the uh, word digital and plural are kind of the same in Taiwan. And I'm really interested in education. And uh, when I saw your interview, you mentioned like education in Taiwan, like not digital literacy, but digital competence. And I was really interested uh, in the content of that kind of education. like what kind of uh, skills or morality or kind of way of thinking does the education of digital competence teach? And what is your kind of uh, ambition uh, towards education? Like what kind of a uh, content uh, or like, yeah, way of thinking should be taught in education in your view? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think in education, uh, what we're looking for is um, autonomous interaction toward the common good. Uh, and that is true for both basic learning as well as lifelong learning. So I often say it's PBL, but it's purpose-based learning rather than project-based or problem-based learning, that the purpose is the common good uh, that uh, allies us together. And the reason why is that if we focus on the team spirit, on the competence of working as a team, uh, with random strangers in different time zones in different cultures, then we're equipped to see each incoming challenge as an interesting learning opportunity. On the other hand, if we over-identify with individual-to-individual -individual competition, then if the uh, problem that uh, we encounter is larger than a scope that an individual or a very trusted uh, small number of people can tackle, then we have this learned helplessness, like this is beyond my pay grade, I don't want to tackle it anymore. Uh, but once we have this uh, helplessness response, uh, then we stop learning, right? We, we stop acquiring uh, new competence. We're basically just building our taste uh, in saying, oh, this is um, my uh, domain and that is not my domain. And within my domain, I'm okay to solve it until the solution is automated by a AI. Uh, and then I feel worthless and feel bad about myself, right? So basically because of the emerging um, um, trends of interdisciplinary um, problems that require interdisciplinary um, collaboration. So this kind of common good anchors us in the, as I mentioned, the solidarity, the relationship muscles uh, that we build, which can be renewed very quickly and is enjoyable uh, rather than over identifying on your grades on something require external validation because that changes very quickly and it's very difficult to recover once you outsource your intrinsic motivation <laughs> into something uh, that is an extrinsic validation. So more learning, uh, less education, uh, more co-creation uh, and less top-down examination nation that would be my general idea yeah thank you it was very interesting that mm -hmm. the concept of digital competence is so interdisciplinary yeah mm -hmm. thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much minister i think that's quite an ideal we we are also striving for here interesting keisuke go ahead um thank you so much i'm really honored to, to ask you a question in this format my name is Keisuke Kudo, nice to meet you. Um, well, I, I've seen a lot of um, progress that you have done and it's really admirable thing. And within like seeing those pr progresses, I've kind of doubt that what makes you feel like you wanted to do that? What is your motivation to do? And also that the question are regarding to this, um, how do you come up with that motivation? 
Yeah. As I mentioned, I, I'm just doing this for fun. <laughs> Uh, and so it, I don't require external validation because uh, to me it's, it's fun. Uh, it's very enjoyable for me to uh, read about like 10 different viewpoints uh, that fight each other uh, and go to sleep and have a full night's sleep, uh, eight or nine hours, and then wake up with an aha moment that says, oh, actually, you know, they have this thing in common. Right, so, so I really enjoy this process of turning uh, tension, turning uh, opposition into co-creation. Uh, and every time I think of something like that, I was uh, like truly blessed uh, and I feel joyous uh, to share uh, that actually, you know, the people against marriage equality, the people for marriage equality, they all care very much about long-term relationship. That's the commonhood. Uh, and then let's unite uh, over that and, and so on. So, so this really cheers me up. And because this is entirely internal, I don't require anyone else to tell me uh, whether uh, this good idea or this is bad idea. Instead, uh, anyone who offers a very different viewpoint, I feel blessed because I can then learn from them uh, for something else that I have not yet uh, synthesized uh, into co-creation. So to renew uh, my own spirit, it uh, suffices to simply look around the internet and see people um, doing attacks uh, on uh, the policy that we're making, uh, because that is the invitation uh, for us to engage them on their own terms uh, to the parts of their um, ideas that are authentic and really represent something that we have not yet thought of or experienced. And so that really keeps him up. All right, thank you so much. Um I just wanted to ask another question, sure, which sure. is re, re, mm -hmm. um, kind of related to mm -hmm. what if the topic which you are focusing on are the thing that you really don't want to face with? Mm -hmm. For example, for us as a student, we might have some obstacles and we, we have less motivation to it. How mm -hmm. can you come up with motivation mm -hmm. in that situation? Sleep. Uh, just go to sleep. Uh, and sleep for a sufficient number of hours. Uh, what looks like tension or obstacle uh, feels just downright easy uh, after a sufficient amount of sleeping. Uh, I think this is pretty scientific. There are a lot of papers uh, about this particular phenomenon. Uh, and I, I don't put a upper bound uh, of my sleep. I think uh, because I just returned from Italy uh, to Taiwan, I think uh, in the past 24 hours, I slept for 13 hours. And, and that is entirely fine. And I'm now feeling very good. So uh, whenever I feel there's something that I cannot face, that it's a real obstacle, I'll just sleep on it. Uh, and my uh, colleagues all know I don't rush to decisions. I always say, yeah, let me just look at those evidences. I'll, I'll sleep on it. Uh, and the more complex it is, I sleep longer. Okay, yeah. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Keisuke. Ekana, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, Minister. Thanks for taking mm -hmm. the time to talk to us today. Uh, so my question is relatively straightforward. So while Taiwan is at the forefront of digital democracy, not everyone in Taiwan or the rest of the world is digitally literate. Mm -hmm. How then do you ensure sort of accessibility in digital mm -hmm. democracy when this mm -hmm. is the reality? <laughs> Yes. My own grandmother, uh, my father's mother, uh, is around 90 years old, uh, and she knows digital probably only as line video. Uh, that is to say, uh, we regularly talk to one another over line video. I go uh, to visit her every couple of weeks, uh, and the uh, intervening weekend, we just do line video. Uh, she doesn't carry a smartphone uh, with her uh, because the words are too small uh, for her, uh, but she is very interested. Uh, in digitalization and have always a lot of ideas. Uh, when I roll out uh, new policies, uh, my grandma is my focus group. I always test by her and her friends. Now, the, the trick here is that we always find someone who plays the role of an assistant, so, which is also part of my idea why AI needs to be assistive intelligence, uh, because just like the hearing aid uh, that my grandma used or the eyeglass uh, that we wear, a good assistive technology um, honors the person's dignity, right? It aligns with my vision, literally my vision, uh, instead of pushing pop-up advertisements to my retina. Uh, it is uh, accountable in a sense that if it breaks, I get to fix it or take it down the street for the repair person. We don't have to pay like $5,000 NDA or sign a agreement or something, right? So it is 
uh, empowering people closest to the pain or the lack of eyesight as it were. Now, if we structure our technologies like that, then people who are not digitally very well connected can always find someone that is just slightly better on the ladder uh, to help them. So for example, uh, when we um, introduced a mask uh, pre-registration, we made a point of having the pharmacists of the convenience store staff and really anyone uh, who are a little bit more versed uh, on the digital technologies uh, to work with the kiosk or the automated systems so that the automated system take away most of the chores uh, but the elderly people can always walk to the convenience store uh, near their um, region uh, literally just a couple uh, minutes walk at most uh, and then present their health IC card uh, and then the staff takes uh, the rest uh, inserting in kiosk, taking care of the payment and so on. But because um, people of my grandma's age, they can still learn all right, uh, neuroplasticity and all that. Once they learn that uh, you just click here, here and there, and you can pay by cash at the counter, and then you get your masks and so on. Uh, well, they feel empowered because next time they can take their friend uh, to the same convenience store and then don't have to bother the staff. Uh, they just go, you know, you insert the car here and do here, here and here. Right. So it's not about uh, a lot of experts uh, and people who like rely on those experts is about this very gradual ladder of expertise that everyone can just connect a little bit more uh, to their original community um, helpers assistants and then uh, empower themselves to become a coach to another so uh, then this goes viral and uh, people uh, take pride uh, in helping each other the same goes for countering this information online for many uh, civic technologies if you make it easy enough for people to tutor one another then even very old people eventually pick up something and they feel quite secure that this is both swift and safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, Izumi, go ahead. Yes. Um, uh, hello. I'm a little bit nervous, but at the same time, I'm really, I'm really glad to like have this opportunity to ask you a question. So thank you for coming. So I would like to ask a question also about our collective learning. And I was surprised to um, learn a, a new concept of digital competence, competence um, instead of digital literacy. And you mentioned that learning is easier uh, rather than to be taught. So what is what is what can teachers what can teachers do for teacher? What can teachers can do for students? Or what is the teacher role in the fields of collective learning? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I've encountered many good teachers and professors, uh, especially after I drop out of the school, uh, so that uh, we are at an equal peer-to-peer uh, -peer relationship because I'm not um, obliged uh, to show up uh, to their class. Uh, but uh, almost immediately after I drop out of middle school, I started attending uh, undergrad and grad level uh, classes. Now the uh, professors, they don't say that, oh, you're not my paying student and so on. Uh, but actually, they treated uh, my research interest uh, very um, seriously uh, and started working together. Now, I think the, the idea that the teacher is teaching something uh, to me motivates me less than the teacher is a researcher or a learner themselves that are very interested in some um, unfathomable uh, problems. Because if it's um, very easy to uh, distill into standardized answers, then I can just learn it online. <laughs> I don't have to uh, listen to a teacher, the online teacher. You can rewind, you can slow down, you can speed up, you can play many times. Uh, like real person will probably get angry the first time you do that, right? So uh, it's always preferable if there is already a standardized answer or curriculum. It's always preferable to, to do this like entirely autonomous uh, but on the other hand, the curiosity, the, um, the feeling that every time we talk about something, something um, unexpected, spontaneous may happen. Well, that is the best. So uh, the professors and teachers that I kept a working relationship after I dropped out of the middle school all have their very interesting research agenda. And they're interested in not just explaining to me, but also making sure that uh, I have some room to contribute uh, there as well. So again, 
there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in my encouragement to teachers is also to share your immature research agenda uh, to the student so that it can be driven by students' own curiosity and adds to that your own expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So I guess it's something I will have to reflect upon myself too, indeed. Uh, Lena, go ahead. Thank you for coming here. I'm really nervous to ask question, but I have a question about future. So nowadays, our quality of life has been improved or improved thanks to the technology. However, looking to the status quo in detail, the situation is kind of skeptical, right? Like even the data technology has been developed, we cannot choose our parents in the first stage. So, so like because of that, in the future, that like opportunity could be really like divided uh, between the person who had the money or not. So, do you, so I have a question about that. Like, do you think that problem will be solved by data sciences in the future? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think this is a very good question, but it's uh, one of the few questions I heard uh, today that cannot be answered in a very short fashion. This really requires an hour long seminar, uh, but I, I will try to answer in, in very broad brushes. Um, first of all, um, as you pointed out, the current generation of data science tools rewards aggregation of data and rewards investment into the tensor or GPU uh, hardware. Again, that is concentration of capital uh, in order to deliver uh, good results. This is the, the true thing. Uh, on the other hand, um, so is the uh, healthcare, like really expensive um, machines uh, for CT, for MRI, and so on. That it has the same pattern. Uh, or um, the same goes uh, for the transportation, um, like building a high speed rails. That's also very capital intensive and uh, requires lots of centralization power and so on. But in each of those cases, uh, in Taiwan at least, and in also other social democracies, the state uh, has said that the basic minimum uh, acceptable standard for universal healthcare, for universal transportation, for universal communication need to be like this. So that in any place in Taiwan, if you cannot get um, 10 megabits per second for our uh, video conference like uh, bandwidth, if you do not get that for just 15 uh, euros uh, per month, then it's my fault, like literally the digital minister's fault. Uh, you can hold me to account and people actually do. Uh, and so once we have this social norm that says even though it requires a lot of money to invest in the spectrum into nowadays the Starlinks, lower Earth orbits and so on, it's very capital intensive, uh, but we see that from a rights framework, as in this is a human right, uh, rather than from a privilege framework in the sense that we want to optimize efficiency of allocation of resources. Uh, we always say for this uh, social core um, of our nation, this is not about efficiency, this is about equity. Uh, now, there's also other parts that's not covered by this thought. Uh, the universal health care, for example, uh, does not cover at the moment um, cosmetic uh, surgery, right? But it does cover dental surgery. So each community need to agree upon some sort of norm, beyond which uh, it is for the free market uh, to explore, but uh, below which uh, is essentially a human right framework. And that um, overtone window, that the window changes. Uh, once more uh, research becomes development, once more development become commodity, once commodity uh, become open source uh, in a maker economy, then we can move more and more uh, things into this socialist uh, core. Uh, that is very broad brush and I really don't want to generalize because it's not the same in computation technology, in communication technology, uh, in educational uses of uh, digital and in industrial uses of digital. It's all very different, uh, so I, I, I will not generalize more, uh, but as much as I can generalize, that is uh, basic thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. So we have uh, Saiki again next. Go ahead. Sorry, I just, uh, uh, there are many questions I would like to ask, but uh, choosing some of them is not, uh, it's been difficult. 
but um uh yeah i was i was always thinking like how can japan like implement some of the innovations that taiwan has been implementing over the years you know uh from these digital innovations and uh one question that i often have is that uh within asian asian societies uh i i feel as though there is rigid hierarchical hierarchical structures especially from our daily life and from within our workplace and how does like the taiwan government or the uh, uh, people um, try to promote this like participatory stance and um, allow for new ideas and innovations to take effect um, as you have done so far. Thank you. Um, first of all, I think the, the equity based uh, thinking is important, right? When we uh, introduced the uh, one laptop uh, per child, um, idea uh, that um, basically make sure that uh, students become co-creators in their curriculum, in their agenda, in that they can participate meaningfully in middle school and especially in uh, senior high. Uh, the what kind of classes uh, that the school uh, will create? Uh, so just like the undergrad level studies, but implemented on the junior high and senior high level. Um, so the laptop is not just a screen uh, for the teacher to push content through, but rather it is a creative canvas uh, for the student to co-create. Uh, to make uh, into possible newer uh, materials and curriculums for uh, their classmates, but also for everyone around Taiwan. So this is a, a rather powerful idea in that equity can be furthered uh, by this crowdsourcing of materials and crowdsourcing of creative commons uh, materials um, from our students and so on. They become <coughs> co-teachers, co-creators, uh, so to speak. So this is the, the basic idea. Now, um, I would also uh, say that to further this idea of creative um, commons, it is important not just to involve the basic education, but also lifelong education as well. So we have a lot of uh, endeavors where the local elderly pairs uh, with the young people, uh, maybe on the Pokemon Go uh, narrative uh, that improves the OpenStreetMap and Wikipedia, uh, or telling the story in their own, um, one of our 20 national languages, uh, or Mozilla Common Voice, uh, where they can contribute to the mission understanding of their own language and things like that. And I, I think in the Japanese uh, context, uh, this is, Quite familiar, right? I've visited many uh, regional re revitalization uh, projects or the strategic zones and, and so on, and they all have this focus on not just preserving but revitalizing the local culture and the connection between the elderly people and the young. And if you focus on this intergenerational solidarity, then it uh, I wouldn't say weaken, uh, but it make more flexible the hierarchical uh, like seniority culture that both Taiwan and Japan have. The other hack uh, that I often introduce is the idea of a reverse mentor, uh, so that in Taiwan we have a system where people younger than 35, around 35 of them, um, gets invited uh, to be advisors, to be uh, advisor of the cabinet, of the ministers. Uh, and we, we call them commissioner or use counselor and so on. Uh, it's exactly Wei Yuan, exactly the same way as we use for legislator, for senator, and so on. Uh, and so because we respect seniority in our hierarchy, but we respect the official rank even more, right? So now the uh, younger people, like maybe early 20s, uh, once they are a Wei Yuan, a commissioner, a legislator-ish uh, thing, uh, not really a member of the parliament, but member of the smaller parliament uh, within the administration, uh, then people start treating them uh, with respect, and they treat with self-respect, and and uh, they feel they have a real duty now to make something that's tangibly uh, feasible, not just uh, critiques, but rather uh, constructive criticism and co-creation. So um, one of the earliest uh, champions of e-petition, uh, when she turned just 17, started uh, a successful petition in the movement that bans plastic straws from our bubble tea takeouts, Wang Xuanru. 
uh, turned 19 uh, when she became uh, our commissioner for national action plan steering committee to our open government. Uh, and so uh, then I refer to her, even though she's uh, just 19, uh, as Wang Weiyuan uh, from that point on. Uh, and then she uh, just tours around different uh, high schools and so on to introduce this idea that it is the, your contribution uh, instead of your age that defines uh, your relative social rank or position. Uh, and when the career public servants many in their 60s and something, uh, consistently refer to these very young people as Wei Yuan, uh, as uh, essentially senior official. Uh, then uh, we built a culture where it's focused more on your contribution rather than your age, uh, as Commissioner Wang Xianru have said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Interesting, thank you. Uh, Kiwamu, go ahead. Yes, uh, it is a great honor to be here, Minister. Uh, I am a big fan of yours. And I have two questions here. First, last year you were invited to the Summit of Democracy by US President Biden. Uh, that was an online platform international conference. And you attend uh, out of conferences yeah, via the internet. How do you evaluate those styles of conferences? Secondary, regarding Taiwan's democracy, especially with digital technologies, how do you protect Taiwan people from cyber attacks and other intervention by host countries while the uh, people in digital democracy? Thank you. Uh, both very important questions. Um, indeed, uh, in the past couple of years, because of the pandemic, uh, I've been invited to more and more senior level meetings. Uh, prior to that, um, people know me as a teleworking minister. I've attended via robot uh, to a UN Geneva meeting and so on. Uh, but for this kind of video conference, uh, we always uh, meet with just middle rank people uh, who are younger and more comfortable uh, with video conferencing. Uh, they're truly uh, senior decision makers, senators, and so on. Uh, it's not that they didn't use video conference. They did use video conference in their youth. It's just a video conference was a really bad experience back then. So they just don't want to use video conference uh, when, when they uh, achieve the position of seniority. That's for, for people who can who must be, um, you know, to, to bear uh, the, the lack of uh, good quality communication. Now, uh, for the pandemic times, uh, a lot of software, including the software we're using, rapidly improved so that it's now uh, not bad at all to have a video conference with each other. Uh, in fact, uh, you can see each other rather clearly. It was not a high latency as before. Uh, a lot of assistive intelligence machine learning went into place so that when we, uh, like just now, we lose your voice from this second to the other, uh, the machine actually completes <laughs> the sentence for you. That is quite magical uh, use of uh, machine learning. right? So with these technological advances that strengthens people's connection, rather than uh, replace people. It now becomes okay for the senior people uh, to relearn video conference and they clear the cache in their mind. It was not as bad as before, uh, so they're willing to engage more. So uh, that went to the highest level, to the UN assembly level meeting, the Summit for Democracy, as you mentioned, the future of the internet declaration. Uh, I listened to uh, Fedorov of Ukraine, uh, like relating their experience using digital um, in a geopolitical event in a war uh, and so on so so and I, I feel uh, although not quite co-presence not quite in the same place I, I do feel the nonverbal um, messages uh, very clearly so I think this is a good thing that we have now cleared our, our cash in our minds and we embrace video conferencing more now uh, the um, other question uh, I think this is not just about the technical cybersecurity, which is easy if you think of it as a uh, like counter-pandemic kind of way, where people uh, make good habits, right? Just like fighting the virus, it's important to wash your hands thoroughly. Uh, I see many people wearing a mask, uh, keeping social distance and so on. So can uh, basic, very basic cybersecurity practices, always use multi-factor authentication, keep a backup in at least uh, two physical places in three different backups uh, in choosing uh, the software, uh, keeping them 
up to date, uh, but do not uh, log in by any particular vendor. Uh, prefer open and free uh, audited uh, assured open source software. Uh, these are just like washing your hand, right? You probably have heard this countless number of times. Uh, but if we make it a community of practice where people just do this, quite visibly, not individually, but quite visibly, uh, and become a culture, uh, then uh, most of the cybersecurity attacks can be mitigated uh, by the defense in-depth system uh, incorporating those good habits. Conversely, if we do not have good habits, if we over-authorize in a proprietary system the boss, the CEO, although they do not use any of this day-to-day -day function, we just give them super user privilege, uh, and they uh, keep the same password, never used uh, two-factor authentication, then even the best cybersecurity firewalls and so on will fall uh, very quickly because uh, they do not have good cybersecurity habits. Uh, and so I don't think this is technology alone. Technology like um, the zero trust uh, framework and so on works precisely because uh, for me a passwordless uh, cardless authentication is also easier. So it's safe and it's also more swift. Uh, if you force me uh, to use like 20 digit uh, uppercase, lowercase, exclamation mark uh, as my password and uh, block the paste function so I cannot even use the password manager, uh, actually it lowers the security, it doesn't increase the security. So good habits, I think, is the very good first step. Thank you so much. Uh, Tatsuya, go ahead. Hey, uh, I'm so excited to talk with you. Uh, because you were one of the greatest hackers, and uh, I read the, your books, yeah. And uh, my question is about uh, uh, the democracy of Japan. Uh, I think the uh, democracy of Taiwan uh, is so successful because of the uh, open government, the idea of open government. Yeah, but uh, in terms of Japan, uh, the digital ministry was organized in recent years, but uh, uh, this ministry doesn't uh, seem not to work well. So in this case, uh, do you have any ideas about the, uh, what the specific obstacles or and the, how to solve them? And the, uh, especially, uh, is it possible to introduce open uh, the idea of open government uh, in Japan. Thank I want to ask you about the point. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, I am not intimately familiar uh, with the day-to-day -day operation of your digital agency. Uh, but I do believe that uh, in the introduction of the my number, uh, the unique ID of the uh, citizens and so on, they took a very incremental approach. That is to say, not forcing everything to use that ID, especially not commercial transactions, uh, but rather just incrementally for healthcare, for simplifying the procedures, uh, while very clear on leaving no one behind, like not taking away uh, the existing benefits uh, and so on, just because people do not like to use the My Number uh, system right away and so on. And and I don't think this is bad. I think this is actually pretty good. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, we've coexisted many of those measures. Um, people still now can, when they file their taxes, can still go to a tax office desk and do it all on pen and paper. It's just most people now just use a phone, right? Uh, and they just authenticate very quickly and they don't need to remember any password or anything. As I mentioned, the SIM card already authenticates them uh, and so on. So most people use these automated ways uh, or if they need some help, they go to a convenience store. Uh, if their uh, tax is below 1,000 US dollars, they can also pay via cash. Uh, to the convenience store. Again, very convenient. So uh, all sort of ladders uh, for people uh, to be on. But if we just pull out the lowermost ladder uh, of like doing this the old fashioned pen and paper way, if we pull that, then the legitimacy just crumbles uh, because people would say you're now excluding people. So I believe uh, Japan is uh, taking the same approach 
uh, and uh, although exponential uh, looks like really slow <laughs> at the beginning, I do hope uh, that it will eventually um, go exponential and instead of sacrificing the legitimacy as we've seen in many other jurisdictions that want to push through uh, by a minor uh, majority, by a small majority, uh, the idea of national ID card or something and then the next party uh, goes into power like in the UK and then everything else goes back, uh, right? So, so rather than that, uh, like going back, um, I would rather that the direction is firm and then we go initially more slowly. So I don't think there's uh, anything wrong with the leaving no one behind approach. This is not a racing competition uh, after all. So this is the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, I think uh, there's a lot of participation on a local or community level in Japan. Uh, there's a lot of room uh, for people to contribute uh, to their township, uh, to their prefecture, and things like that. Uh, what people look uh, to Taiwan and see this as uh, like very amazing is that we also have this national level uh, participation platform, national level participatory budget, presidential hackathon, and things like that. But in terms of um, land mass and population, uh, I mean, Taiwan is just one larger municipality in Japan. So maybe it's not a fair comparison uh, to say that you have to do this on a Senate level, on a Congress level, uh, but rather focus on the prefecture or municipality uh, around the norms. Uh, I think that works uh, rather better in Taiwan uh, because our high-speed rails allows for the northmost uh, Taipei station to travel just 93 minutes uh, to reach the southmost uh, Kaohsiung station. It feels like a small prefecture, even though it's 23 million people, but uh, usually it only scales as much as the norm scales, the uh, resonance between people that when we upload a picture, when we type something, people uh, can assume that this is common knowledge, what I'm referring to. But in very different prefectures, different municipalities, when this no longer is true, then it's harder for a platform or for open government to abstract over uh, the issues over those very different norms. Hope that answers your question. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have time for uh, perhaps if you if you may, uh, Minister. Mm -hmm. I think we have just a few minutes together. Uh, so may I ask? Uh, I would be curious to see if there is questions from teachers, faculty members that would like to jump in. I think that mm -hmm. would be. I apologize to all the students that have uh, raised their hand. There's a lot of questions, but I would be curious to. So is there any faculty member that would like to jump in? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much uh, for being with us today. My name is Shogo. I'm teaching development studies and sustainability education uh, in AIU. My question is about um, your emphasis on diversity and plurality. Mm -hmm. So in my field in sustainability, we talk about diversity along with efficiency, because when we have too much of diversity, the operation cost of system is simply too much. So I'm just wondering how you are taking the balance of the diversity and efficiency in the, in the field of your uh, digitalization mm -hmm. operation. Thank you. Thank you. So plurality is about collaboration across diversity. So it's not about diversity alone. Uh, the police system that V Taiwan and later join uses um, is unlike uh, a letter to the president where people individually write their ideas to the president. There is just no way for the president to read all the letters uh, to the president. Rather, this is more about like posting uh, a short letter to the president, but to everyone else. And everyone else can say, oh, I agree with that sentiment, I disagree with that sentiment. But this is not voting things up or down. This is <clears throat> making sure that people can see <clears throat> where they are in terms of positions. Now, uh, we say the president, or rather the minister, only consider the top 10 agenda, not the most upvoted, but the 10 that is upvoted across diversity. No matter which aisle you are in, you have to convince every other group of your ideas for it to be even considered by the minister or the president. 
So in that schema, uh, it doesn't pay for you to mobilize 5,000 people who vote exactly the same way uh, because it doesn't increase the plurality. That is to say, it doesn't increase collaboration across diversity. Rather, you're motivated then to think of very nuanced ideas uh, that speak to the common value rather than to the issues uh, that cause polarization or controversy. So this is a pro-social rather than anti-social arrangement of things. And we only uh, review carefully uh, the 10 and things that are most pro-social, the things that everybody can uh, resonate with. And this gives a chance for the minorities uh, to develop their appropriate social technology for their ideas to resonate uh, with the larger group because they do not get flooded by the larger group in the visualization. So uh, I hope that answers the question. We never think about efficiency, but we think about effectiveness. And effectiveness is uh, determined by the uh, collaboration, the degree of plurality, degree of collaboration across diversity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. May, do you mind if we push perhaps for one more question? Sure. Mm -hmm. Sensei, I think. Um, yes, um, thank you for coming today. I'm teaching academic English here in AIU, and I'm thrilled to have you um, as a guest speaker. I teach so many students who struggle with the English language. And then um, I'm sure that you use English for communication in international settings. And I, I, it's pity that I, um, I see so many students giving up on sharing their wonderful ideas simply because they're concerned too much about their English language ability. Um, do you have any message to these students who tend to shut down themselves a bit and so that they're not sharing their ideas? Mm -hmm. Well, it's enjoyable uh, if you don't have to do it, right? So I usually just, uh, when I uh, enroll in a different culture, like in Japan, uh, I, of course, rely on the interpreters. Uh, but I also make sure that whenever there is a interpretation situation going, uh, because the kanji is uh, very similar, right? so I, I uh, look at the machine-generated captions and learn at least a little bit of what's being conveyed, what's going on. Uh, so there's two layers of this. One is that for most, English is sufficient if you uh, can read uh, and comprehend and listen and comprehend. It's not that much about speaking or about writing. Uh, and whenever you speak or write, if you use your native language, uh, you uh, express yourself more fully, uh, you can pair yourself with a good uh, machine translation program uh, and then you can look at the resulting English uh, to appreciate the word choice it uses. I use DPL uh, most of the time uh, and they use like very idiomatic um, phrase so I often like just translate back uh, and see uh, if that uh, actually means what I think it means. Uh, so there's many uh, exploratory tools in English like the word vector, uh, many word vector visualizations that can you can let you type in a word and see its uh, meaning, embeddings, uh, its uh, nearby words and things like that. And it's not your obligation uh, to uh, create new um, expressions in English, but rather you can just see it, uh, use Japanese or any other your native language, and then just see the result and appreciate, uh, like looking at a new conversation or an art and so on. I think that increased the fun uh, of things because after all, nowadays we can rely on machine translation and professional interpretation us uh, for more than 90% of our communicational needs. What's uh, important is just to uh, keep a healthy um, perspective toward English instead of associating it with something painful. <laughs> we can associate it with uh, something beautiful. Hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Minister, I think we... Mm -hmm. Agreed on one hour, so I feel bad for going That's over. Fine. Time. Uh -huh. uh, I wish we could. Well, if you have another hour, we can continue the conversation, but that would be perhaps pushing a little bit too much. Uh -huh. I, I would like to thank you very much for your time today. This was a fascinating discussion. Uh, I would like to thank all the students for the brilliant questions and brilliant articulation of that. Uh, thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Really good questions. Live long and prosper. Thank you Thank so much. You. Uh, 
So uh, IGS 200 students, uh, I would like you to fill a kind of a feedback form.